something that I've turned into full-time employment over the last four years. Uh, when I moved to Charlotte, I didn't know anybody. And actually, Jennifer was one of the first persons that I actually met in, in Charlotte um, at an art show at the McCall Center. And during the, the you know, during, during what was around, when I started looking for a new series, I started, I, I needed uh, models. So I, obviously the first person I called <laughs> was Jennifer. I said, hey Jennifer, do you, you got any kids, nieces, nephews, anybody that, um, you know, that, that I can use? And she says, I, I got the per perfect person. And um, she, she came over with Elijah and his mother and his brother, and he was ready to go. You know, right? and she said, this is his first, his first modeling gig. And um, so we didn't necessarily know what to expect, but I can tell you immediately, as soon as he sat down in front of the camera, he was camera ready, he was a star, and I would have never known that it was his first time. <laughs> and all, all of the pictures came out actually really great. Um, I took probably around 200 photos of him, and I could have done at least 40 or 50 of them that I would have chosen. But it was actually this pose here, which, believe it or not, I only took maybe two shots of him in that position. And, and what I usually shoot for whenever I do a photo shoot is that I, I look for a number of gestures, a number of facial expressions that'll um, kind, of, kind of go along with the themes that I'm trying to display. Because when I do these, um, I try to take a bunch at once and then, you know, as I'm doing different series, I'll, you know, capture, you know, pick out those pictures with that emotion. And this was one of two pictures that he took and it just, it, it came out phenomenal, came out phenomenal. So I knew as soon as I saw it, um, it was definitely going to fit in with the, with the series that I was doing, which was a series that I was starting on, um, just my thoughts around, surrounding Corona, surrounding um, this, this time of political turmoil, political unrest, uh, police brutality. I wanted to talk about those things, but not address them in the traditional way as we do as adults, but really, look at it through the loop, the, the view of, the, the lens of how our kids are viewing this. Because, you know, it, you know, for all of us, this is nothing new. Um, you know, the, the police brutality, the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, you name it, it, it's nothing new to any of us. Um, well, one, we, we, we have never seen the Capitol building storm before, we, so, so I guess that part of it is. But, we also have to take into consideration of how our children are viewing these things mm -hmm. and what are the conversations that we're having with our children about these things and what are the emotional results of that as well. Um, when, when we think of you know, all these things, you know, again, we've been through all of this kind of stuff and, and familiar with it, but we've never gone through it through the lens of a pandemic you know, looming overhead, you know. So that's something none of us have ever experienced. And that's what our children are going through right now. So I, I really wanted to capture the emotion, the frustration in this series with that. And so with this piece, I knew, I knew that this was definitely going to be a part of it because even as I was considering it, um, it, was, it was exactly around the time of Breonna Taylor's death. And so it was just so fitting and so, you know, for me it was, it was just a frustrating time. And again, I'm thinking about our children and how we're having these conversations because again, my daughter's 10 years old and there's been, there's been cases where she's shown me videos of things happening before I even see them. So, you know, our, again, with access to social media and just the technology in general, our children have a better understanding or have a clearer view of what's going on and, and we have to have those conversations with them, but also along with that, what are the stressors that they're going through? You know, so that's that's what I wanted to capture with this, and he's I, I, I'm grateful for him uh, participating in the school fashion show where he got discovered. <laughs> he rocked the stage. He rocked the stage. Yeah, I, I saw the video. Oh yeah, he's ready to go. <laughs> So tell us about your technique. I, I don't think everyone's had the opportunity to actually see the piece yet, but when they see the piece, they're going to realize that it's actually layers, like it's not your typical piece of artwork. Tell yeah. us about your technique and 
Yeah, so um, what I do is, this is this is a technique I've developed over the course of 20 years um, using carpentry as a hobby. I don't know if anyone knows anything about my background, but um, I started out, you know, coming out of high school, you know, I was a football player, played Ohio State, played in Kansas City, and then I spoke my professional career as a pharmaceutical sales rep. But throughout that time, I've always looked for creative outlets. I used to be a really good sketch artist, used to draw, paint, went to an art school in middle school and things. And um, once I got into sports, it was it was over for for art for me. Um, you know, when you're when you're going at a high level like that. And there's some people who have been able to attain that kind of balance between, you know, life and sports, but, you know, I was all in, you know, all my free time was spent, you know, watching film and lifting weights and doing everything else, but art was something that I kind of dabbled in it, you know, here and there. And what I ended up doing is once I was done playing ball and I started getting back into it, art wasn't as fruitful for me as it used to be. And a couple of reasons for that is, one, it's a, it's a skill like anything else. You know, if you don't use it, you lose it. And, you know, I had various football injuries to my shoulders, so it just wasn't, I just wasn't as passionate with the results. I wasn't as satisfied with the results I was getting. So I got into carpentry. So basically what I was doing was fixing up my houses and selling them. And then, you know, I tell people all the time, like, if you do something 20 years, you're gonna get good at it <laughs> eventually. And I got to the point where I started creating furniture. And then, um, you know, it, it was, it was um, at that point I started to kind of look around and see like, you know, different furniture styles and looking to do unique things with furniture making. And um, I, I came to this epiphany, this conclusion that there was no thing, no such thing as black furniture, black American style furniture. You know, there's, there's African influenced style furniture and decorations, and there's a lot of factors that go into it, but to me, there was nothing that was uniquely black, you know, it, as far as I could tell. Because I always tell people that if you, you know, no matter how successful you are or where you live, if you took the pictures, if you took the art out of the home and the pictures, there's a few things you couldn't tell. You couldn't tell if a black person lived there, and you couldn't tell if a black person made the furniture. And that's something that's different, um, you know, as black Americans, that's different for us because again, traditionally, if you look at any furniture from any other country, you can tell where it's from if, if you're into it. But, you know, <laughs> that was my thing. So like, I can look at a table and tell you whether it's Victorian or modern, which is obvious, but I can tell you which, which area of a country or which part of Europe it came from based on the flowers you know, and based on the, the, the floral patterns on it um, in Victorian design, or what type of ornate, you know, de 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 decorations surround the mirror, I can tell you where it's from. But again, when it comes to anything that's distinctly black American, there was nothing that I had seen. And so I started down that path, and this, this <laughs> coming out of it, um, and, um, so what, what I do, I've developed several things, several skills for this. Um, one is photography. So I, I, in order to do the photos, I have to take a picture. Um, and then I do a digital drawing, digital markup drawing. And then I go ahead and then draw it out, which is fortunate for me because everything that, that I learned um, throughout you know, the furniture making process is everything that you see here is every technique that I've learned. Uh, from that. So now I'm at the point where I don't just um, want to do uh, just images of portraits of famous people, but I do want to tell my story as well. So that's how I came up. Okay, Elijah, you got to talk this time. So tell us how it feels to be a part of this project and see yourself in the newspaper, on TV. How do you feel working this project? Yeah. 
He did good. So Elijah's the coolest person ever. So for him to say all that, we're like, ooh, he did good. Um, so I think, Mom, we're going to ask you a question as well, just to get your feedback and how you feel. Um, because this has been a journey, and I think a lot of parents don't know what goes into modeling and the sacrifices. Tell us how it's been for you working with Percy and seeing your son. Um, it's definitely been exciting. Um, I, as he said, never thought that this would be a thing. Like, again, it started in the school fashion show. <laughs> so, you know, he killed the runway then, and, you know, from there, he's just like, I want to be on the red carpet. I want to see my name in lights. So I'm just like, okay, well, what do I need to do as your mother, as your parents, you know, to make sure that you, you get that. And he's been so serious in, you know, we have little photo shoots and, you know, he has headshots and everything that, you know, I want to make sure that he has if that opportunity comes up. So, um, you know, just, just being by his side and taking the necessary steps that he needs as his parent to get him where he wants to be. So it's been exciting. Okay. All right. Because we are going to be, um, you have to, we're on a time limit. Any questions from the audience? All of these pieces that you see, well, his name is by them, are by Percy King. Um, this is Elijah's piece. Do we have anybody that has any questions? Or are y'all ready to look at the art? I, I think it's amazing all the different techniques and, and styles that bring such life that, like you said, people don't, don't normally see things in such a different light. And, um, I love, I love a lot of this people for me, my baby, but um, the, just all of your different techniques, it, yeah. it's just so interesting and the details and the, just everything that I, I've seen, just the, what, a little bit of it that I, when we walk in the store, it's yeah. different. It, it's, it's been an exciting journey for me too, not, not having an art background, um, for me to get into it, and even do it full time was really kind of naive because I didn't know anything about art. I was just like, I like to make stuff. It's hot. Let me put it out there and see what happens, you know. But um, it, it, had I known, it would have been very intimidating, you know, to see people doing things like what Beverly Smith is doing and the detail of her work, you know, not only, not only is she just quilting, but she's doing several different styles. Oh, I thought so, that was your Yes, no, that's, that's Beverly. So she does, um, obviously the quilting, which she learned from her mother and grandmother. Mm -hmm. And not only, not only that, but within that, she encodes secret messages in those too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it'd be better for her to explain it, but there's different things that go on in there. Um, like for instance, uh, one of the patterns or some of the patterns that she uses were used um, during slavery when the slaves would uh, sew secret messages into the quilt using different symbols for the Underground Railroad yeah. and contain different messages. So she incorporates that in those too. Not only that, but for each piece she also sews in a different message which will never be seen. Um, but on the inside of the quilt there is a, a piece of cloth with a message on it now. I don't know what they'll say, but <laughs> they are in there. Um, I have a question. Um, so what was it about furniture that grabbed your attention that made you like passionate about it? Well, it was just something that um, I had always, I had always been drawn to it. Um, one, because I'm cheap, I don't want to pay nobody for myself. <laughs> I'm gonna make it myself. Like one of the first projects I ever made to be honest with you, was a speaker box when I was in 10th grade. Mm -hmm. Dude, I had I had um, two tens, and I built the amp. I put the amp in it, crossover. I had the speaker. I did it all by hand, it like <laughs> like the Amish. You know, I, I got a real saw. I was sawing. <laughs> Took me almost a month to build this thing, and um, I go to put it in the trunk, but it's 86 grand down, and it was too big. I just wasted a whole month, but. It was just something that I always knew I liked. You know, I, I, I was always creative, but my mother always encouraged me um, in the arts and, and to, you know, do different things and try different things. So it's it's something that, um, you know, was not foreign to me when I started doing it, because I knew I liked it. And I knew, you know, it's like one of those things, like even with Elijah, once you see someone doing something in a path that you like, it's easy for that to be real to you. Like, I, I always tell people too, like, 
when you know it was easy for me to you know picture myself in the NFL because I saw everybody going to the NFL. You know, so it was like, okay, this is an option. Um, so with woodworking, it was kind of a similar thing for me as well. So it's it just um, it, it felt a functional need and a and a uh, cost need because, like I said, I didn't want to pay anybody. For it. <laughs> so um, one more question: You said that there's really no like African American furniture. What do you think that that would like look like? It's like a standard. Like what different like cultures would. would I mean, it, it, and that's the thing, again, it, it, that's a huge, huge question to answer because with any style of furniture, there's certain things that go into it, whether it be from a spiritual perspective or um, just a functionality perspective or regionally based on the type of trees and based on the heat and the cold, those types of things. Um, so I really had no idea. I felt like I was making it up. Um, you know, for the first time, and and again, um, it, it definitely has to be something that has to grow organically amongst the people. So it has to be, you know, a people from a particular re a region or something. So, for instance, like in Ohio, we, we have a huge Amish population um, in Orville, Ohio, and whenever you go there, they're famous for missionary and Shaker style furniture which is very minimalist and clean and straight lines because they don't, because part of their religion or part of their beliefs are that they don't believe in being too fancy with anything. But within that, they've created their own style. Um, so, you know, as far as what black furniture looked like, I don't know. My, my original intent was to do an inlay of Bob Marley into cabinet doors yeah. for a bar set. And yeah, that's what I started doing. And, Got halfway through and I'm like, one, this would be too expensive if I charged it for it. And two, I'm like, this is this is a piece of art, you know, like I, I might as well figure out how to put this on the wall. And uh, that's that's what I ended up doing. Yeah, the, the layering is amazing how the lighting and the um, it just is uh, how your creative mind I mean I would never have even dreamed of Taking a photograph and doing it like that, layering it with the with the wood, different woods. Yeah, it's 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 something that that I I came up on. You know, again, I kind of I went I don't want to necessarily say I stumbled upon it, but it was definitely something where I had an aha moment because you know we, we all view things through our own perspective. You know, and I've seen drawings like it, I've seen paintings like it in the style, but um, I've never seen anything in wood and. That wasn't even my, my intent to create something completely original. Wasn't uh, you know my intent when I started. I just was following a passion, and even the layering part of it, that even came much later because I was um, you know creating the Bob Marley piece, and you know it had already taken me like two months to do it. You know it was my first time doing it, so I'm kind of figuring it out as I go. And I thought I had it finished, and I had it laid out, and you know it was like two in the morning, you know, and I was. I tell people, you know, the Holy Spirit told me, get up off the couch, go out in the garage, and start stacking the pieces, you know, and see what that looks like. And so for each, each, each one of these pieces, I usually end up taking about 300 pictures because I have to work with it laying flat, you know, because they're loose. So I layered the pieces, I took a picture of it, I looked at it, and I said, that's it. That's it. I got something here. <laughs> Definitely. I will say that, you know, initially when Jennifer called me about the opportunity, she was like, I can't tell you what it is. Like, she kind of kept it all over the <laughs> She was just like, it's a photo shoot. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, we're going to get, you know, a new shirt. We're going to get new jeans. We're going to make sure you got a haircut. So she didn't tell me exactly what the, the photo shoot was going to turn into. And when he finally finished it, which, you know, it took him some time. But when he finally finished it, like, she's like, so I gotta show you something. And like, she sends me the picture, I bawled like a baby. <laughs> because it, it definitely turned into something that I didn't even put in my head, you know? So, um, yeah, like you definitely, sorry, getting teary out. Um, <laughs> definitely, like, this is everything. This is everything and 
I wish there was a way to, I don't know, like, I don't know. It's beautiful and I thank you for it because he will always remember this as his first modeling opportunity. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Oh, you're <laughs> this is the uh... <laughs> Because mama's crying. We can't get the picture from mama. <laughs> okay, Look up, Elijah. Let us see your face. Yeah. There you go. Smile with your eyes, baby. <laughs> you know what to do. All right. <sighs> you all right, mama? <laughs> so, um... So before everyone gets a chance to start walking around, I do want to thank, I don't see um, Kevin and Monique anymore, but thank you. Oh, there they are. Kevin and Monique from Studio 229. Thank you so much. Percy, thank you so much for coming out to do this so we could celebrate him and his greatness. And I didn't even think this is Black History Month. You get, you're a part of history for real. Um, thank you to everybody from the school. Where's the school? Raise your hands. Hey, y'all. Hey. My teachers, that's Miss Parker. Miss Parker actually brought, got me out to the school to do the fashion show, and I told her then. I was like, you stuck with me from now on. Um, but thank you to all of the, his friends and family for coming out. This is a big deal. Um, we have to keep celebrating each other, celebrating our wins, um, and finding ways to incorporate art to have conversations. Um, because that's what it's really all about. I, I know COVID has things kind of crazy now, but if you do get an opportunity, get out and visit your local galleries. Some are still open. The museums are still open. Um, that's all I have. Now we're going to do a tour. We're going to look at the art. We'll do a quick tour. And for those of us that got here early, so, wait, are you grandma? Somebody said grandma was here. Somebody's grandma here? She, so this is grandma. <laughs> hey, grandma. <laughs> but okay. she has literally, since he was like Six four or five months, yeah, four, yeah, four, been in our lives. I so love it. She is definitely yeah. family. Um, and, you know, when it, she definitely told me I was pregnant. <laughs> like, that's always her story, but she definitely told me I was pregnant with him, and she's always been by our side through everything. So, you know, when I told her about this opportunity, she's like, oh, my God, does he have a model coach? Does he have an agency? Does, you know, she's on it. And, <laughs> and she, um, she, like, she, her and her husband, her and her family, have always been by our side again over 15 years now. So, yes, that's grandma. And also thank you to Cupcake Couture who has desserts on the other side. We'll end up over there. She is Cupcake Couture. I am Cupcake um, <laughs> You want to tell them what flavors they have so they'll know what um, they're getting into over the there? The flavors of the cupcakes, um, there's banana pudding um, cupcakes as well as just a basic vanilla cupcake. And then the strawberries, there's dipped strawberries. Um, banana pudding strawberries and also dipped sliced apples so if you don't necessarily want a cupcake and you, you want to do healthy but not healthy we got the fruit <laughs> all right that concludes this portion thank you again for coming let's look at some art now, I, I have to jump oh. on a zoom call so i'm going to jump out in the car real quick but i'll be back when you guys tour is over if you guys have any questions or we'll talk about oh,